This is a centenary cavalcade of flight and we're talking with Jeff Smith. What was your first association with flying? Oh, well, that goes way back to 1931 when Harry Baker and Snook and Jimmy Woods brought some aircraft up to Mute. That's a little town 15 miles out of Collie. And of course, everybody for miles around us came and they were giving 10 minute flights, I think for five shillings or seven and six, whatever it was at that particular time. Snook crash landed on my uh, grandfather's farm. Not crash landed, he got out of it all right, it went over on its nose. Did he intend to land there or did he? He did there? not. Well, only because he ran out of petrol. How he landed there, I don't know, with all the stumps and what have you on them. He was landing downhill and fortunately there was a creek just before the fence and ran into the mud and she just gently went over on the nose, but they flew her out. And that stimulated uh, that interest in, uh, oh, yes. in we aeroplanes? We were always out at Mainland's Aerodrome. In the early days, we, we lived in Mount Lawley and every chance we got, we'd pop out there. What sort of aeroplanes would you have been seeing in, in those times? My cousin came down and that would have been on a repeat. She was uh, evacuated from Victoria River Downs when the Japanese came into the war. So you would have been there when the DC-2 started flying? Yes, um, but I didn't know very much about what they were. They were just aircraft, and uh, in those days all we wanted to see was them take off and come in and probably see if they'd ever crash. <laughs> <laughs> and then when you had your first flight, was that when you joined the Air Force? Or? When I joined the Air Force, yeah. In, in the 1940s by then? Uh, I signed up in 1941, but I didn't get away until uh, 42. You had a quite an association with Catalina Flying Boats as, as, a, as a radio operator. Yes. What did that involve, Jeff? Oh, it just uh, really involved. There were always two radio operators because the Catalina flights were so long and usually the operational leg was anything up to 17 to 20 hours. So uh, you had two operators and you swapped over every two hours and you had to keep your a watch on the on the frequency and you had the uh, ASV or the was the radar uh, to look after so when you came off that you spent about half a three quarters of an hour on the ASV then had a break and came back to the ASV and then two hours back on the radio so your whole flight was organized around that. So those, those flights um, up into Asia, what was the average length of those? Because my understanding is the Catalinas had quite a range. Yes, we'd normally go to a forward base. I was based at Corumba and I flew also out of Cairns and out of Darwin. But from Corumba, our forward base would have been Groot Island. Okay. Where we'd go to Groot Island, top up with fuel, and of course you're landing with a full load of bombs, so the pilots <laughs> were pretty good. It didn't lose very, very many of them. And then you'd go out on your operation, which, uh, well, on this day in 1943, our trip from to Ambon, or Amboina as we called it, it was 17 hours, then back to Groot Island, then you'd refuel again and have breakfast and chuff off back to Karumba. The 17 hours was the return trip, was it? Yeah, from, from takeoff to landing was 17 hours. Jeff, were you, uh, in your radio work, it would mostly have been wireless telegraphy, would it? Oh, yes. So were you involved in communications with the ground by voice or was that always the pilots? No, the pilot was invariably the one that was in contact with by voice, yes. And that was uh, in the landing area, really. And you mentioned, Jeff, using um, short what we used to call shortwave radio then, which we now call HF. Yes. And um, that would have required a long, long wire antenna. Were there any particular arrangements that had to be made for the long wire antenna? Well, you had um, what, 200 feet of trailing aerial, if you wanted that, but that was for the low frequency. Mm -hmm. But you had uh, huge aerials that went from the tip of the aircraft wing to the tail, which was, um, well, the length of a Catalina, I think, 56 feet, and the wingspan is 104 without the plates. So, so what we're talking about is a long wire antenna that actually trails out the back of the aeroplane while it's flying. Yes, it, it comes out onto the hull, of course. And, and what uh, happens if you don't pull it in? Uh, well, as a matter of fact, you do lose it. <laughs> <laughs> but well, I'll, I'll say this, that one of the things, uh, or one of the little tricks the pilots used to have, of course, was if the aircraft was clouded in or anything like that, or uh, misty, they might want to judge their height as they came in. So you would put the trailing aerial out until it 
tip the water. And whatever speed he was doing, we knew what height he was, uh, 150 feet above the water or what have you. So how did you know that it actually made contact with the water? Is oh, you could feel it. it oh, okay. Right. Oh, of you course. Could de you could definitely feel it. Oh, it vibrated a little bit um, mm. at any time, but when it hit the water, it, uh, it really did a bit. <laughs> so that's your f first, first IFR approach using a long wire antenna. <laughs> This would be particularly good in uh, flying boats with the glassy water because that's so difficult to judge that's your height. True, too. Mm. Were there any other problems uh, that flying boats, particularly uh, and particularly Catalinas, caused for the for the radio man? I suppose the long hours was um, mm. the, the biggest problem. I was always on the gun from we over the target, and the the other wag always put his steel helmet under the. <laughs> Somebody told me that the crew duties were divided up. One of the things that the radio man was involved in was starting engines. Another thing was actually mooring. Oh, yes, uh, slipping and mooring was always the always my job, which I enjoyed. Kevin Brinsley was the skipper on this particular aircraft, and we had to go all the way to Manila and back through Perth, Adelaide, and to, to Rathmine. And when we got to Cairns, the port motor wouldn't start. So the only way you can do that is get up there with a big handle and you just wind it round and you start off at about one turn every four seconds and when you get it up to two turns a second, he throws them in and invariably they start. And the person that's winding is sitting right behind the propeller then, a pretty hazardous occupation. Oh, well, you're right, occupation. Behind the, right behind the end of them, but the, the worst thing, of course, is the fact that you've still got to get back into the aircraft when she, <laughs> she's going. <laughs> <laughs> and rotten buggers like Rinsley will often give the throttle a bit of a turn as you're trying to get your feet down <laughs> through the hatch over the navigator com compartment. I can't imagine pilots doing that sort of thing, no, actually. No, no, no. <laughs> there were, there were <laughs> exceptions to the rule. Jeff, when you came into Perth, did you use Crawley Bay all the time or some of the time, or did you all go the, to all uh, of Guildford? The, time. the Australian Catalans were all flying bats. Okay, uh, they weren't uh, amphibians. Yeah, they came out at, came out as amphibians, but they went straight to Lake Boga, and the wheels were removed, and so was all the ceiling around the petrol tanks. Oh. <laughs> Bigger petrol tanks were put in, and uh, so we had a range that was, um, you know, we could go, I suppose, two thousand miles. Pelican Point nowadays is fairly um, bare of buildings, apart from the odd yacht club and scouts and so on. What did it look like back in 1942? Later in the war, of course, on the American side, they had a hangar. Qantas had a open hangar that they used to work under. But yes, they had a slipway there. The Yanks had a slipway, and they were well set up. They only had those huts. And how did they refuel the aircraft? Did um, did they take boats out there or did you come into a, a jetty mooring or something to refuel? No, they had a refuelling boat. Did. So uh, people driving along <coughs> Mounts Bay Road in those, those years uh, would have probably always seen some sort of flying boat moored in, in the Crawley Bay area. Oh, well, the, the Yanks were here from February 42 through to early 45 i think and of course now there's a catalina association jeff that uh, that you have some interest in as well oh yes yes and what's happening there I, I read that uh, that you now have a catalina that's coming back to perth it, it's back in perth it has been back in perth for quite some time it's still in its um, plastic covering and what's going to happen with that? What, uh, what can we they're look forward to? Well, hopefully, when they can raise enough money, they're going to put it where the Americans were uh, and mount it there in a museum. So the building museum, but that's the, the catch, of course, is the uh, you know, raising the money for the museum. How do we finance it? Is there an association between the, the, the West Australian or the Australian Catalina Association and, the, and some of the Americans that were here during World War Two? No, but we... We've still got a lot of friends. There's a lot of, quite a lot of people over here that were uh, with the Catalinas during the American Catalinas. Uh, a lot of Dutch Catalinas landed here. That's right. I understand a few of the um, pe the Americans that were here were uh, taken by Australian women, and therefore they remained here thereafter. <laughs> well, that, that, that at least they came back. <laughs> Jeff, uh, just getting back to the Catalina Memorial then, is, is it envisaged that if things go according to plan and we get the money, 
that uh, we can look forward to seeing a Catalina displayed uh, at a prominent place. So when we drive down Mounts Bay Road again, we might see a Catalina sitting up there. Well, I don't know the design of the museum, but uh, I understand that it'll be facing the water. I understand it'll be in a um, glass-sided building. At least three sides mm. will be glass. Jeff, uh, you talked about the role of the wireless air gunner, or as you called them, WAGs. <laughs> Uh, obviously the wireless part was wireless communications and, um, and as you've mentioned out that was mainly using a uh, Morse code key, but the gunnery side of it. Well you always had to man the guns of course when you were over the target and the Vista compartment they had a .5 Browning on both sides that fired I think 650 rounds a minute. They had a, a Browning 303 machine gun that was pointing down through the hatch at the back quite useless really because you couldn't uh, see anything until it was just underneath you. And then they had one in the front and all manually operated. The original Catalina's up to about A24, 80 or thereabouts. They had just the one gun in the front. They eventually had twin 303 boundaries in the front. Uh, they were just a manually operated turret. You just stood out there in the breeze and had and your glasses, were going, your goggles were going to stay on, and they never ever did. Yes, we very rarely used them, although over the target, uh, I would man the gun in the front and uh, stand aside as the navigator lay down between my legs to, because the bomb aimer's window was right in the front of the aircraft, and he'd lay down there uh, to drop the bomb. Sounds like the navigators were rather heroic if they took that position. <laughs> yes, they were. <laughs> we had one occasion where we were attacked, and that was uh, three aircraft in the attack, but it was a night attack. Uh, the first one made a, an attack from the front, obviously sighting on our flame from the motors, that's about all they could see. And um, the skipper vows and declare that he never ever pulled out of the dive that I was concentrating on the second one coming in and um, the third one was so far away and still <laughs> still attempting to make a thing but obviously he had lost sight of us at that particular day and we, we could see there uh, they were above us so we could see them in the against the sky. So Jeff the, your your particular group was based up in Queensland North Queensland was yes it? we were based in Kurumba in the Gulf of Carpentaria. That was originally one of the Qantas bases. They, they landed there, they also landed at Goode Island and they went from there to Townsville. So the base was already uh, well established when we got up there. And the, and the principal um, operation that, uh, that the Catalinas undertook out of Carumba was, was a bombing role? Yes. Maritime or? We did two escorts across the top, the convoy patrol not convoy patrol so much as fast ships, they went in convoy, they, they just went. Tell you what, the Navy didn't give you a great deal of information, they much rather depended on their speed. Mm. But uh, yes, we did, and we never ever did any anti-submarine patrols or anything like that. Uh, but it was all, I suppose, 80% of it was all bombing and mine laying. Were you also involved uh, specifically in reconnaissance roles, or was it always in, in your particular role um, acting as a bomber? No, no, from Cairns, uh, we used to do what we call the milk run over the Solomons and what have you and come back to uh, Moresby and then back to Cairns again. But that was just a reconnaissance role at that particular stage. So uh, by the time I was on operations, the, <laughs> the Americans could see everything, so they didn't worry. Yeah. Australia's rather devoid of water, so if you were based in um, Cairns and you, um, you flew to Western Australia, um, or if aircraft flew to Western Australia, not necessarily you in particular. Where did you have to stage in between for uh, refuelling? Or were the aircraft capable of flying right across Australia? From, from Cairns on operations, we refuelled at Moresby or Milne Bay and then went further on to Kaviang and places far north. Um, from Kurumba, our forward base was... Uh, oh, Cairns also, from Cairns, they, operated out of Horn Island for a while. They'd refuel there. And from Carumba we went through Groot Island and then from Darwin uh, we had no forward base other than Bonaparte Gulf when you were doing mine dropping operations and you flew down to um, Bonaparte Gulf. What we call Sheikat in those days when we first went there was an American seaplane tender 
used to come and uh, you probably have four aircraft going out on a op each night so we'd go down there and probably have to wait for the second night so we were to rendezvous uh, yeah. on the ship the tender, and, yeah. with all the glorious <laughs> food that the Americans used to supply then we'd come back and go back to Darwin. So then if you were coming, coming down to Perth example would you have to follow the coast around to be able to oh no no coming down to Perth you flew directly overland Perth would be yeah. about what an eight hour flight uh, gee which I wish I had a um, log book here but I think it was a bit more than eight hours it was uh, probably yes. ten so the DC3 pilots are, are nodding their heads as well I noticed so <laughs> something like twelve <laughs> mm. yeah. but it was always an overnight trip from down down to Perth yeah so it would probably be eleven hours we are coming down there with a chap by the name of Ian Smith and um, we were flying overland there and the navigator asked me to get a couple of DF bearings because he appeared to be too far inland and what have you and uh, so I got a couple of DF bearings and <laughs> for the record and um, then I was asked to signal for permission to land at Geraldton and we duly landed at Geraldton and who was waiting for the navigator but his fiancée, she was the nurse at the Geraldton Hospital. <laughs> Never go to all that stupid. <laughs> <laughs> when I look at my logbook, we had them almost the same flying hours when we came direct. <laughs> we uh, had the children. All yeah. things were possible, Jeff. Oh, that's right. Brinsley was another one. He, um, we got to Perth. We were flying back around the coast and then from the Bight, we were to go up to um, Rathmine. And anyhow, we were, we were off course and Kevin wasn't the pilot at that particular time and asked the a DF bearing and could I get permission to land at Adelaide? And his father was waiting for him too. <laughs> it's remarkable, isn't it? I mean, without radio, none of this would have been possible. <laughs> yeah. Jeff Smith, thank you very much for talking to us on the Centenary Cavalcade of Flight and I look forward to, uh, we look forward to uh, the Catalina Memorial. Let's hope it all comes together. We're so do I. Mm -hmm.